All right, hello everyone. This video will introduce you to the course focus for English 102, which is what makes us human. Now, not all English 102 classes have a course focus. However, I find that having a course focus gives us a nice little bit of grounding and a little bit of a starting point uh, from this kind of very broad research question. We can then kind of narrow things down. And my intent here to be transparent is that we are mimicking the process that you're gonna go through this quarter. You are not required to answer this question in your final paper. You're not required to write specifically about aspects of what makes it seem in, although you're welcome to. So a course focus is just that guiding theme. Again, you don't have to answer the question. Your final paper may be unrelated to this. Uh, so as we think about this, just think about it as a starting point. And as I go through this video, think about how you might begin to answer this question if you were doing your own research. What types of things would you type into Google or ask Siri or whatever it is that you're using to do your research? So when we think about what makes us human, right? Again, this is a humanities class. Uh, so it's also a research class. So asking these questions is something that is important uh, as we think about who we are and how we relate to other people and what our place is in the world and all these sort of philosophical questions. And I would encourage you, uh, if you're of a mind to, to go ahead and pause the video and really think about in your own mind what things, doesn't have to be one, make us human, quintessentially human. What things maybe differentiate us from things that are not human. All right, and I will go ahead and pause for a moment in case you want to pause. And I'll go on to the next slide. So in no particular order, I have a list here, and they're the things that often come up when I talk to classes about things that make us human. Now, the first two are probably the most common, uh, but I think that these are things that are very interesting and they are scientific or faith-based. Uh, but what happens if we try and push beyond those first two? Because, yeah, we could say that, you know, well, it's obvious. Biology makes us human. Our, our DNA sequence is something that makes us human. Or if you are a person of spiritual belief, you might say soul or spirit, and that is the thing that makes us human. The problem with the theological part is it is a little bit harder to do research into, uh, but if that's an, interest, uh, an interesting topic to you, please let me know and I'm happy to work with you there. Now, as we kind of push beyond that, things that often come up are things like linguistic ability, creativity, empathy, laws, morals, ethics, reasoning, social structure or caste systems, relationships, metacognition. Now, Again, if we think about these, are there animals that demonstrate a linguistic ability? Yes, there are. Uh, are there animals that demonstrate empathy? Yes. Uh, so again, no one of these uh, alone differentiates us, except for maybe the last one here, which is cat videos, because I haven't seen any other animals make cat videos, although maybe cats are smarter than us and they've tricked us into making them. So again, just things to think about. Now, if... I had started with this broad question of what makes us human, and this is my list, any one of those things might be an avenue for me to further explore depending on my personal interest. So if this is my broad research question, I can then narrow it down into, say, language or creativity or empathy, and I can begin to go in that direction to find more sources. So let's take a, a slight step aside for a minute. Uh, and I promise you, I am not one of those English instructors who will bombard you with Shakespeare. Um, so in Hamlet, uh, Hamlet in this particular scene is kind of wrestling with loss and with meaning of life and debating internally uh, the meaning of humanity and existence. And he's kind of talking about how impressive humans are, how they're the height of beauty and intelligence, right? He goes on the paragon of animals or the high point of animals. Uh, but it does sort of question the, na the nature of what makes us human. So I would say that even kind of asking this question is something that is quintessentially human. 
It also means this question is one that's been around for a very long time, and each generation is sort of struggling with some aspect of this existentialist question. Now, if I'm thinking about how I want to research this, it's best to sort of ask a lot of questions. So let's say we want to start with a very basic question. If we want to know what makes us human, then maybe it's good to ask how do we know when someone or something is human? Now, again, the common answers that I get is that something looks human, that they sound human, and that they behave like a human. Now, there's a lot of variability in these things. Uh, so, you know, what does it mean to look human or sound human or behave human? I would assume that as you're watching this video, you assume that I am human because of a variety of different things. Now, that may or may not be true, right? I could be a computer program uh, run by a semi-sophisticated uh, program somewhere, right? There is a very wide range of differences in human uh, ability and cognition and all of those things, which we know, right? We have different differences in brain function, uh, differences in IQ, depression, anxiety, ADHD, all of those things. We have genetic differences. We have personal, personal preferences. We have cultural preferences. So we have to kind of broaden out or look further afield to answer this question. And that's, I think, what makes a good research question. So later in the quarter, as you're thinking about your research question, it shouldn't be something with a very you know, ready answer to it. Uh, so while DNA is a very ready answer to the, the question of what makes us human, we would have to nuance it a little bit to make it a new or interesting answer to the question. So there are kind of three categories that I feel like I might go into. Again, this is all just kind of food for thought, demonstrative purposes of how we could go about this. So maybe when I think about intelligence or humans, I think about intelligence and awareness, what we might call sentience. Well, if you look at the image here, what you'll notice is that these are all artificial intelligence, right? Whether it's, uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator or Wally -E, or actual artificial intelligence like IBM's Deep Blue or, uh, or Watson, those are artificial intelligence. So we have something that is able to mimic to some degree human intelligence. And there are a lot of things that we could research here with something like deep learning or machine learning, which is how artificial intelligence is now moving beyond a pre-programmed algorithm into being able to actually learn, right? Uh, much as humans do. So I'm going to skip over this next slide. Oh, good problem, good problem. there we go to looking at sort of the aspects of artificial intelligence. So this is what happens when we begin to do that passive research, that we begin to go, oh, well, artificial intelligence isn't just one thing. There are different branches. So we get virtual assistants, something like, you know, Alexa or Cortana, which is the sort of basic artificial intelligence. And then we get something more sophisticated, uh, like Watson's IBM, which is very good at going and finding information and maybe even doing some learning on its own. And what we see in media and movies and books is this sort of artificial super intelligence, which we see uh, as something that is even more intelligent than human beings could be. And there's a lot of question as to whether or not it is possible to actually program a an AI that would be more intelligent than humans and what that would mean for the future of humanity. So, you know, again, there's a lot here that we could further unpack, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. So if you want, you can pause this and you can kind of unpack this a little bit more. So if we have artificial intelligence as something that is not human, right? It is not biologically human you know, soul would be out of the question, uh, but it does have ability to communicate and ability to um, synthesize information. Empathy would be a huge sort of uh, question as to whether or not we could actually have a, a computer with empathy. But the next thing would be to think about hybrids, a hybrid human, right? Uh, somebody who is partially not human, right? And so what would it mean for somebody to be more or less human. Uh, I don't think that anybody would argue that somebody with a prosthetic limb is somehow less human. 
Uh, and there are a bunch of directions that we could take that philosophically uh, by looking at uh, you know this sort of argument of what happens if we pl replace all the component parts. <laughs> so within cyborgs and hybrids, we get things like prosthetics, uh, we get life-saving aids. So again, somebody with a prosthetic arm, they can remove their arm, they are still alive. But somebody with a pacemaker or an insulin pump, if you remove that prosthetic device, for lack of a better term, they are no longer able to live. And then we also have these things like enhancement, right? Somebody can enhance their abilities beyond human using something like an exoskeleton. So we've kind of been working with this idea for years and years, right? Since the first use of glasses and hearing aids. Um, but what's interesting is we, what we could increase vision or strength. These things are temporary. Um, they are not something that can be passed along to another generation. Uh, and so, you know, we can kind of begin to unpack what would it mean in this case? Now, another way to take this in terms of research would be to say, you know, I'm kind of fascinated by this idea of, you know, implants or uh, prosthetics and how they're being used. And one could narrow down in that direction. Now, the last one I want to talk about here is genetic engineering. And this is a very fascinating question as well, as far as how humans uh, could modify ourselves with lasting impact, right? Something that could be passed from generation to generation. So, you know, we know that we've cloned sheep, we've made glow-in-the-dark rabbits, true thing, by the way. Um, we've got movies like Gattaca, which experiment uh, with the idea of what would happen if we could go in electively and m manipulate DNA to create a best possible human. And that leads to this sort of ethical discussion of designer babies. So hopefully what you're seeing is there are like various directions that any one of these could branch out and then branch out again. I could look at what makes us human and decide that, hey, it's something to do with our DNA. And that could lead me to this question of designer babies, which might lead me to an ethical question. So again, within that whole idea of genetic modification, we get different avenues that we could sort of go down, whether that's stem cell uh, therapy or gene splicing or enhancement beyond what is normal or natural. And again, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, but this would be, again, one of those cases where we could look at the application, the technological application of genetic modification. We could also look at the ethical issue here uh, and whether or not you know hey we can use this stuff to solve or cure diseases but also the other ethical side of that which is this idea of designer babies which who can afford that right and it's going to create a potentially a bigger divide between rich and poor okay so last couple of things here can i give you a definition i've had students ask this no i mean uh, I have a definition and we can talk about that as the quarter progresses, but it's an intellectual experiment for you to begin to think about how you would navigate this question. And if you choose a question that is different from what makes us human, that is totally fine. Uh, and you'll kind of be going through the same process. Start with a great big question and then narrow down into smaller and smaller component parts. And if you end up getting too narrow, easy enough, we just simply broaden back out again, right? Uh, so again, hopefully that gives you a little food for thought, gets the wheels turning a little bit. Um, and in the meantime, if you have questions, comments, concerns, jokes, memes, or recipes, let me know. Otherwise, I'll talk to you all in the future.